you know, uh, everybody always asks me, what are you going to talk about? And I always say, I'm excited about hearing what I'm going to talk about, because I never know. Well, Georgia didn't tell you she was trying to get a record deal backstage. <laughs> she left that part out. You know, I just uh, have a conversation. But I always like to look at the room. Something about being quiet and still and the energy that you get. So I thank you for that. So today I was checking in my hotel and this gentleman said to me, he said, you know what, Dr. Knowles? It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Think about that. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. I figured out about five seconds ago what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to share my journey. I grew up in Gaston, Alabama. So how many people know where Gaston, Alabama is? Raise your hand. All everyone who knows and knows and knows and knows. And there we go. Nobody knows about Gaston. Well, my dad, Matthew Sr., was a truck driver. He made $30 a week. $30 a week. But he convinced owners to let him drive that truck all the time, and he tore down old houses, and he sold all the metals, bought old cars, and sold every part on the car. My mother was a colored maid, made $3 a day, $3 a day, $15 a week, do the math, $45 a week. That's what my parents made, $45 a week, Michael. But you know, my mother would get her best girlfriends, and on the weekend, they would sew these beautiful quilts. And by the way, I lived on a dirt road in Gaston, Alabama. Now imagine that. Imagine Beyonce and Solange's dad living on a dirt road. Parents made $40 a week. And I have the privilege of talking to you. And I see a lot of young people. I'm fortunate and privileged to be a college professor. So I just want to talk to you for a minute. I can be here. If I can be here, growing up in Gaston, Alabama, on a dirt road. And by the way, I left out a, a, another important part. We were probably, I was 14, 15 before we had what they call outhouses. I know you're not. You have no idea what that means. That's where I, that's been my journey. That's been my journey. Growing up in Gaston, uh, never went to a black school. I'm 68 years old. That makes me the oldest in the room, right? So I was the first. First in elementary school. One of the first blacks in junior high. One of the first blacks in Gaston. Hi, one of the first blacks at University of Tennessee. But you know, my dad and my mother, they always instilled in me to be the very best that I could be. They taught me how to dream. The impossible dream. They taught me how to dream the impossible dream. What was that dream? How to find my passion. How many of you know your passion, Rachel? Your my passion is to motivate and to educate in three areas. Music business, entrepreneurship, and we'll talk a little bit at the end about health and wealth. By the way, I have to look at this time clock. Okay, there it is. So, 
What is passion? It's the thing that energizes you. It's the thing that makes you determined. It's the thing that wakes you up in the morning excited like I am every day. Yesterday I was in class at Prairie View A&M. Got home at 12 midnight. My class is at 6. 6.40 in the evening. Weird, weird time, 6.40. And I have to drive an hour. I don't do that for money. I do it because I love it. My wife asked me, why do you get home so late last night? I said, finally, you know, semester just started, the fourth class. We finally connected, me and my students. And so what does that mean? That means after class, my students finally wanted to have these dialogues and conversation. And I loved it. That's my passion. My passion is right here, right now, this moment, to be in front of you. Because when you live, this wonderful thing called passion. You know, people ask me, well, dude, when do you sleep? I sleep well because when you live your passion, you never work a day in your life. That has to be quite an experience to do something you don't love. That's not a part of you. Please find that passion. And, and passions change, by the way. You know, what I was passionate about when I was a young man, I wanted to play basketball, played high school, played University of Tennessee, excuse me. And I have a, young, a lot of young men in the room that might think that sports and, and, and hip hop is the only way, rap is the only way. Let me tell you, that's 1% industry. The music industry is a 1% success rate. To get into the NBA, NFL, baseball, this 1%. Give you an idea, 37,000 albums we make a year, 370 are profitable. So if that's what you want to do, you better be practicing. But you can't, you can't practice and give it your all unless you're passionate about it. Because what coexists with passion? Work ethics coexist with passion. You know, I, I always say you can maybe outsmart me, but you're not going to outwork me. And I can say that because I love what I do. I'm very fortunate. I, I get to live a life today that I don't have to do anything I'm not passionate about doing. I can't wait till you can have that sense of ownership about the word passion and those work ethics. And certainly I can't in this brief moment talk about these 10 traits and, and hopefully we'll have another opportunity, but I will talk about a few other than passion and work ethics. You know, it, and I'll talk a little bit, I don't normally, this is something I've never done actually. I'll talk about Beyonce. Do y'all know her? Y'all can do better than that. Okay. So I'm going to tell you, you know, one of the traits I find out about highly successful people is we. And I like to put me in we. Learn from failure. You see, I've learned through many mistakes, mistakes in my marriage, mistakes in my being a father, mistakes owning my company, mistakes even speaking. Hell, I've made a few already. <laughs> but what I've learned is failure, mistakes, they're all opportunities to grow not a reason to quit. And for me, before I get to Beyonce, a lot of my failures had to do with ego. Ego. So I'm going to give you a definition you've never heard of ego. Not in Webster. I'm going to give you that definition. It's the anesthesia 
that deadens the pain of stupidity. Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. <laughs> Drop the mic on that one. See, I, I, I love doing this to have fun and, and hopefully share. I don't get uptight and you know, there's no right or wrong way for me. It's what I feel at the moment. This moment we'll get to share for the rest of our lives. We spent this moment together. So it's a very special moment for me to share it with you. So Beyonce was a young kid. And at nine years old, she was on this show called Star Search. So think American Idol. These girls were little girls, kids. They lost. But guess what? Justin Timberlake lost. Aaliyah lost. Boys to Men Christina Aguilera lost. I can go on and on and on. And you'll find that these highly accomplished people that we all look up to, they failed in their lives. They lost. Beyonce lost. Then her and her girl group, Girls Time, then got a record deal with Electra Records. They got dropped. For those of you that don't know what that means, they got fired. <laughs> That's what it means. And then Destiny's Child went on to be the most successful girl group in the world. I did say the world. <laughs> but guess what? When Beyonce made her first solo album, Columbia Records said, there's not one hit, Beyonce, on this record. Not one. They were kind of right. They had Bugaboo, Crazy in Love, <laughs> Dangerously in Love. I can start naming. She only had five. They were kind of right. She didn't have one. She had five hits. What is the question inside? What is the point? The point is, and we had time, we would talk more about being a visionary and, and others, but, you know, sometimes people don't understand your vision. And when you're passionate and you have the work ethics and you have the right team, you still will make mistakes. So I share to you my largest, biggest professional mistake. Solange, my youngest daughter, got signed to Interscope, Jimmy Iovine, a legend, Dr. Dre, a legend. So they had this new product that they wanted me to help them get into Walmart. And I said to them, I don't want to get a check. I want ownership. They said, Mr. Knowles, unfortunately, we can only give you 1%. Well, the company was the Beats, and they sold it to Apple for $3 billion. <laughs> My wife reminds me all the time when she's angry, you know that $30 million? That was a big mistake. Boy. Thinking outside of the box, I did want to say that before I leave and close. Often I have a box, and I ask, one person to get in and invite someone else to get in the box. So let's imagine this square is a box. And the person they invite, I ask them why. Because we have been conditioned since childhood, since childhood, what we can't do because we're poor, because we're black, because we're Hispanic. We've been conditioned what we can't do, not what we can. I call that box in thinking. And so we put people in our box just like us. That's the only people we want, box in thinkers that think, because we were conditioned. So all of our life, all we do, if we pretended this was a box, we would hit walls all day long because we've been conditioned. But once you Step outside of that box. There are no walls. There are no walls. 
And hopefully someone understands what I'm saying. Once you step outside of that box. So I'm going to close now. And I always do this. I, I, I've had the opportunity to speak many times, and I ask everyone to stand for a minute, please. Could you please stand? So I like to tell a story. I travel a lot, and I was going down an escalator. But you know, I want to regress and back up. In July of last year, I had a dot on my T-shirt. Imagine a red dot. Take a pen, a piece of white paper, and a dot was on my T-shirt, inside of my T-shirt. The next day, another dot. The next day, another dot. You know, I was fortunate. 20 years I did diagnostic imaging. I sold zero radiography, uh, the leading modality for breast cancer, first black man to sell MRI scanners in America, and ended up a neurosurgical specialist. So I knew when I saw that, that dot, something was wrong. And I sold mammography equipment. And yes, men do get male, what I call male chest cancer, also known as male breast cancer. And I went and got an x-ray, a mammogram actually, and an ultrasound and found out that's what I had. I immediately had surgery. But the first thing I asked myself, why? Why me? And I remember going down that escalator that I started that story. And there was a nun from Mexico she had a jar and a missionary. She asked, please give. And I gave. She gave me a card, like some of you might give me a card today. I'm very transparent. I'm not going to read that card. But I finally one day looked in my pocket, and I did read this card. That's what I want to end today with. It said, pray not for a life free from trouble. Pray for triumph over trouble. For what you and I call adversity, God, the universe, whatever name you want, calls opportunity. That was an opportunity for me. And I go all over now and I spread this story about male chest cancer and early detection for men and women, and a BRCA genetics that you've never heard and I don't have time to explain. But I wanted to share, just like today, this man said to me, out of nowhere, it's not the destination, it's the journey. Thank you.